Hey everyone, it's been seven days since my last video, and I must confess, society is still fucked up. Welcome back. I'm going to pick up from last week to explain in more depth why I said feminist views on rape are based in neurosis. More directly, I said that the act of sex poses psychological problems because it reminds us of death. This is not my unique perspective. There is a body of work called Terror Management Theory, which has summarized this in great detail, and I'll put a good summary link in the low bar. So, let's start out with the question, do men and women approach sex differently? Here's a little Louis C.K. Because we have to fuck you, and that's kind of gross. There would stop being people if we weren't pigs a little bit. Because we have to get on top of you and just fucking fuck you. You gotta be kind of a pig. Women get to be elegant during sex. They lay back and they pose and they just... Even aggressive women on top get to put their hair up and do a whole thing. And... Now I'm going to be quoting from an article called Fleeing the Body, a terror management perspective on the problem of human corporeality. Why is the human body so often a source of shame anxiety, disgust, and other difficulties? Why do we work so hard to transform our bodies into something other than what they are? Our bodies are almost always subject to rules prescribing proper ways of hiding and decorating them, such as wearing a fig leaf, brightly colored feathers, or the latest designer fashions. Radical alteration of the body is popular around the globe, whether this involves piercing one's ear or tongue, removal of some portion of the male or female genitalia, or plastic surgery to change the shape of one's nose or the size of one's breasts. Restrictions are placed on where or how certain bodily functions such as sexual and bathroom behavior should be performed, and in most civilized cultures, these acts are a source of shame and embarrassment, as well as humor. Those who do not conform to social standards and rules for the body are subject to anxiety, shame, derogation, and ridicule. We are stuck with the fact that our bodies are mortal. We have cultural ideas about our spiritual significance above that of other animals, and we universally try to dress up our bodies to create the sense of elevation. Designer clothing, body modifications, makeup. And it's obvious that women are much more obsessed with this attempt to transform their appearance into something divine or artistic. Essentially, we, as Ernest Becker says, attempt to elevate our bodies into objects of beauty, dignity, and even spirituality. This type of existential problem is more subtle in its mortality-denying role, and many people deny their fear of death because they've somewhat accepted their mortality, but the problem is best expressed as a fear of insignificance. The idea that our lives are meaningless and futile to some degree, is something we intellectually can't cope with, and everything we call culture or civilization is designed to overcome that sense of despair. We cope with the threat of death by embedding ourselves in a meaningful culture and living up to the culture's standards. In this way, we elevate ourselves above the rest of the animal kingdom. But how do we cope with our physical bodies, the part of ourselves that is absolutely certain to die and decay? Women's bodies, historically, have been subjected to more taboos than men's, but it would be wrong to see this as an exercise of power over women by a patriarchy. If you understand the mortality issues, it's understandable that women whose bodies give birth and bleed have posed a bigger problem to the goal of presenting humans as something more than animals who die. For humans, disgust seems to be an expression of one's disdain for or superiority to everything from foods and body products to political ideologies and immoral actions. Research has shown that although there is no inherent danger in eating a sterilized cockroach, eating a bowl of soup stirred with a never-used fly swatter, or even having intercourse with a dead chicken, most people find these actions rather disgusting. The body is a problem to us, and yet, beauty has always played a role in social status so the body can also be a source of pride. 
To the extent that one's cultural worldview eschews restraints on sexuality and places positive value on sexual behavior, sexual conquests, performance, and attractiveness can be powerful means of attaining self-esteem. People use sexual relationships to affirm their attractiveness, sex appeal, and virility, all of which can be central components of one's self-esteem. The rituals of acquiring personal beauty, according to whatever your culture deems beautiful, are elaborate, time-consuming, sometimes painful, and quite often very expensive. But even where these rituals are successful in acquiring self-esteem through beauty, the act of sex can still threaten our sense of spiritual worth. So we attach ideas of romance to the act to make it seem more divine. Perhaps the most common cultural strategy for elevating sex to a uniquely human plane is to view it as an expression of romantic love or other strong emotional connection between two people. Human sexuality represents not only our utter creatureliness, but also our ultimate capacity for symbolic relations and interpersonal connectedness. Whether this entails a lifelong commitment, for example marriage, or an openly acknowledged fleeting emotional state, construing sexual relations as the ultimate expression of deep interpersonal feelings moves human sexuality from an animalistic act to an expression of something noble and uniquely human. Another approach to sex, BDSM, also attempts to transcend this anxiety, but through a different means. In addition, contrary to popular opinion, most variations in sexuality are in the direction of being less animalistic and more symbolic than so-called normal sexual behavior. For example, sadomasochism is usually not wild or uncontrolled, but rather highly ritualized, making use of scripts and props, much like the theater, thereby turning sex into an art form. Similarly, most fetishes consist of sexual arousal associated with an object that is closely associated with the body, but not the body itself, such as a shoe, leather, or silk panties. When a fetishist fixates on the body itself, a particular part of the body is objectified. By fixating on an inanimate object or objectifying and idealizing specific body parts, the fetishist escapes the threat associated with a mortal animal body. So. What does this have to do with feminism and the ever-changing legal definitions of rape? What we're looking at in the current rape laws is a pandering to human neuroses. That being said, neurosis is not a this or that issue. People are not either neurotic or not neurotic. We exist on a scale of neurosis. People with more self-esteem and who are more secure with their sense of value in a world of meaning have less neurosis, and this esteem can be found in other ways for people who don't meet cultural norms of beauty. The lesser a person's anxiety, the better they are able to respond to threats against their sense of value or significance in the world. People with high neurosis will be more traumatized by what may seem like trivial events to someone else. Because women historically didn't have access to other means of esteem, other than popping out babies and being objects of culturally modified beauty, or works of art, they fall higher on the neurosis scale when it comes to sex. They tend to demand more romantic elements in the rituals of sex, sometimes to the point of needing veneration as goddesses or acknowledgement of female divinity. Claims that women are spiritually superior to men stem from that insecurity in their ability to compete and find value in other areas of society. When a woman claims she was raped because the guy didn't call her the next day or show her the level of respect that she personally expected, I think it would be useful to understand she's struggling with a neurosis. Well, what happened to her wasn't actually rape. She is actually in a state of trauma. The mistake that feminists have made is to build this neurosis into the legal system so that a woman's subjective feeling of violation or trauma determines whether or not a rape occurred. Well, that's just nonsense. Just because a woman feels like she was raped doesn't actually mean it happened. It means the accused was not aware of her mental instability and wasn't able to properly cater to it. That's not a crime. It's just a fact that the dude didn't have a degree in psychology. So my advice for the day is this, don't call the cops 
when what you need is a therapist. And therapists, stop telling women that a failure to meet their warped expectations of sex constitutes some sort of crime.